Thank you, Anne. I just want to say it is, it's a blessing. It's good for us to be here. St. Paul said, when you're not welcomed in one place, kick the dust off of your shoes and go to another. And I just want to, I want to thank in a special way, of course, uh, our Lutheran sisters and brothers for their warm hospitality this evening, where we can come together and talk about peace and justice, which really I've come to the conclusion, as many of us have, it's at the very core of our faith. It took me quite some time to get on that road to peace and justice. When I grew up in this small town in Louisiana, when we gathered into our little church there, we didn't really critique U.S. foreign policy. We didn't uh, question our leaders. We didn't talk about peace and justice. We did not mention that sin of racism and sexism that was so alive in our community, in our church. I went to the State University, I got a degree in geology and worked hard at that degree. When I left college, it was during the days of Vietnam. It was very easy for me to join the military. I was taught to be patriotic. I spent the next four years in the military. In a way, it was my ticket out of Louisiana. Two years aboard ship as a young naval officer, went to a NATO station in Europe. And then when our leaders were saying we had to go off to Vietnam, um, I bought into that as many of us did. They said we were going to be the liberators. Our cause was noble. The same language that they used to justify the war in Iraq. Isaiah, the prophet of the Hebrew scriptures, said it so well. He said, they will take evil and call it good. They will take the lie and give it to you as truth. And this is what they did in Vietnam. And this is what our leaders did about Iraq. And we bought into that evil and that, those lies. But fortunately today, we can see the lie about what's going on in Iraq. We know it was a terrible mistake. And so many died for that mistake. It was in Vietnam that became a turning point in my life. The violence, the suffering there, losing friends, wounded there. I don't know what else to say other than I was forced into the arms of God. Death was close. I've come to the conclusion, not overnight, but through that experience in Vietnam that has just simply grown over the years, that we are not made for war. Read about the tens of thousands struggling with PTSD, the suicides. We are not made for war. Our God, a loving God, a creator, who has given us life that's sacred and precious, did not make us for war. And I and many have come to the conclusion in our journey of faith, something very important and very clear. God does not bless war. God does not bless killing. God does not bless violence. God does not bless discrimination in its many forms. It saddens me to see the silence of our spiritual leaders, our church leaders. As a Catholic priest in my travels throughout the country, I'm often asked, why are our church leaders, our spiritual leaders so silent? on this war in Iraq. I do believe that many of our church leaders have become corporate executives. Our shepherds have become government sheep. And I have no doubt at all, if we had in the Catholic Church 
women priests and women bishops, that silence would be broken. I know that. But we have learned something very important. Peace will not come from the top down. No, no, no. It will come from the bottom up. We will be the peacemakers. Not the corporate executives, not the politicians, not the spiritual leaders who have grown silent. No. It is our responsibility. If there will be peace in our world, in our country, it must come from us. I came back from Vietnam, my year was up, and I must say I was so grateful to be alive. Back in Louisiana with my family, close-knit family, my siblings, my friends. And I came back different from that person I was when I went there. It was in Vietnam that I lost my hope. This joy that was so much a part of my life just fell apart. And that's what war does. It kills hope, destroys joy. And I wanted to try to rediscover that. I was led to the Merino community by a chaplain in Vietnam when I realized that peace was the only way that I'm going to refine, recapture my hope. And he recommended the Merino community working in 25 countries around the world serving the poor. He said they were healers, they were peacemakers. And I entered the community, and I must say it began for me a whole new world. Six years in the seminary, a lot of reflection, a lot of studies. And then I was ordained a Catholic priest and now assigned to our work in Bolivia. Bolivia is pretty much very much in the news today. It's a very poor country. Most of the people of Bolivia throughout the developing world live on the edge. They struggle for survival. They're in the shacks without running water, without electricity. Most do not have schools for their children. When their children are sick, there's not a clinic to go to to get those needed medicines. After struggling through language school in Cochabamba, Bolivia, and I have to confess, I think I was the worst student to ever go to that school. When I spoke Spanish, they thought I was speaking this indigenous language, Aymara. <laughs> but I went into La Paz, a slum there, and I began to live with the people, the poor. And they became my teachers. And that's the way it works. If we will only dare to put our feet with them, the poor, the oppressed of our world, the victims of violence. They will teach us so much. Bolivia was living under a brutal dictator, General Bonzer, who came into power through a violent coup. And it angered me to see my country there, the United States, giving guns and training to the men with the guns, the bullies, the thugs. They ran the country, and the large corporations back then and today, they're coming into those countries like Bolivia, where there are huge profits to be made from the cheap labor and those vast natural resources. They see us as El Imperio, the empire, the new conquistadors who are there to enrich ourselves to live, really, to profit from the blood and sweat of the poor. It's not complicated. People who live under such conditions, day in and day out, year in, year out, begin to organize. They say, basta, enough. I, was, I must say, I was very humble there as a as a Catholic priest, to be connected to the comunidades de base, the faith communities, the poorest of the poor, coming together in their small groups to read and reflect on the scriptures, where they come to discover this loving God, a creator, 
who has given to their country and every country more than enough resources for everyone to live comfortably and in peace. And they know that this is not God's divine will that they should live under these conditions. They know that the reasons are oppression, exploitation. Countries like the United States and others who come to exploit them. And they are feeling empowered by their God today, a liberating God, and out of this comes liberation theology. I'm sad to say that a lot of people, including leaders in the churches, are threatened by the word liberation. They prefer a model of church that's very patriarchal, hierarchical, top down. But liberation theology, that model is circular. Where all are welcomed into that circle as brothers and sisters, as equals, as hermanos y hermanas. And what's going on, they are simply being empowered by their faith, by their knowledge. And they're saying, basta. And the factories, the tin mines, the universities, and throughout the small base communities. They're coming together to change their world. A world where they know there can be peace and justice and food for the table and a living wage for them and adequate housing and this is at the very core of their struggle. When the poor become organized and speak out against the oppressor there are serious implications. It's dangerous. Many are forced to flee the country with death threats. Many killed. The jails in Bolivia filled up with university students, factory workers, tin miners, and their spiritual leaders, priests and others. And I and others were able from the barrio, from the slum there, along with the Jesuit a couple of Dominicans were able to get a pass to visit the political prisoners and documented many cases of torture. And it was after going to Washington with our findings to bring to congressional leaders when I returned to Bolivia I was arrested in my fifth year and forced out of the country. I came home very sad. I did not want to leave the people there and our work. I tried to go back, could not get a visa. My attention turned to El Salvador, a country far worse than the one I came from. Archbishop Oscar Romero had just been assassinated in his country, gunned down in his church for his defense of the poor. Four churchwomen from our country who went there at the invitation of Bishop Romero to work with the poor were raped and killed by the Salvadoran military. Two of them good friends of the Marino sisters, Maura Clark and Eda Ford. When that happened, it brought many of us to El Salvador. And once again, when we were there, we found our country, the United States, deeply involved, giving guns and training to those doing the killing. I must say I've never seen anything like El Salvador. I was more frightened there than in Vietnam and Bolivia. It was the slaughter of the innocents. So many disappeared. The knock would come on the door at night. There's a list. There are campesinos, the landless farmers, being paid a dollar a day to pick those coffee beans. University students and others, labor leaders, healthcare workers, leaders in the base communities. They were seen as el enemigo, the enemy. They threatened that system of power and wealth. And they were brutal, they were brutal. And our country knew exactly what was going on there. I and others came back from El Salvador and we could not shut up. We had to speak out. And when 525 soldiers from Fort Benning arrived, from El Salvador, arrived at Fort Benning in Georgia,
to start training now on U.S. soil in combat, we said, no, not in our name. We went there to organize, rented this little house, called it Casa Romero, gave talks in colleges and churches nearby. And then three of us said, let's take the message to the Salvadoran soldiers now. It's the time. Linda went to Miglia, who was in the Army Reserves, who had trained at Benning. Larry Rosebaum, an oblate priest who had just come back from his work in Brazil, and I. We went down to Ranger Joe's, an army surplus place. We bought ourselves some army uniforms. A few nights later, we entered Fort Benning at oh, 9, 10 o'clock at night. We had with us this, this very powerful boom box. And in it was the last sermon of Bishop Romero that he gave in the cathedral the day before he was assassinated where he made a special plea to the men in the military. Lay down your arms, he said. Stop the killing. Disobey your superior officers telling you to kill your brothers and sisters, your fellow campesinos. And obey a higher law. That law of God that says thou shalt not kill. Bishop Romero, I must say, um, we can speak for hours about this prophet, this martyr. He was so much like us. He, when he was made bishop, the wealthy of the country said, he's going to be our friend. He won't, you know, shake up things. He was seen as aloof, a bookworm. He always gave people spiritual lollipops in his sermons. I don't know where we picked that up. I don't know if it's in the seminary or clergy, bishops. We like to give out these little spiritual lollipops. We don't want to upset people. We, the message is always otherworldly. But something happened to Bishop Romero. He had this big heart filled with compassion. And he was able to hear the cry of his people. And he felt their suffering deeply. And something happened along the way. He said, I'm a bishop. I have a voice. I have power. My people are powerless, he said, are voiceless. If I don't speak for them, who will? Wow. Wow. If every spiritual leader, if every bishop could feel this way. And he got the death threats. But he said, I cannot leave. I must stay the course. And right, it was the next day after his special plea to the military, he was assassinated. And he inspired us that night, gave us the courage that we lacked to do what we were going to do. We entered Fort Benning, this high security area, got saluted. It was a shaky salute. We were very scared. Went near the barracks where the soldiers were housed. And when the last, and we scaled this tall pine tree. And when the last lights went out, we said, Bishop Romero, this is for you, brother. And his voice just boomed into the barracks. And they were pretty upset with us. We saw this. <laughs> It was like poking the beehive. <laughs> we saw this as a sacred moment. They didn't quite see it that way. <laughs> they came out with their M16s, the dogs, the, the lights, spotted us in the tree, ordered us down or they would shoot us down. We came down, it was time but left the boom box up there with the Bishop Romero's um, message repeated, lay down your weapon, stop the killing. Their work was over, handcuffed us, brought in the FBI, brought us to jail, and then to trial. And it was at that trial that we tried as best we could to put our country's foreign policy on trial that day. But the old judge, Maximum Bob, didn't want to hear it. He sent us to prison for a year and a half. 
And in the courtroom there were our parents and brothers and sisters and friends. And we wanted so badly, I know with my family, to explain why I did what I did. Because they were scared, they didn't understand this. And all we could say was that somehow, and that's I think our experience, we have experiences. There are people in our lives who touch us so deeply that we cannot continue on our journey in silence. They change us. They enable us to speak clearly and boldly in humble ways. And that's all in a way we try to say. Prison was hard, lonely, but I have to tell you, no regrets. We felt at peace in prison because we knew why we were there. And I must say, for me, it was like this long spiritual retreat. The seminary actually was good preparation for prison. <laughs> we wrote hundreds of letters, got lots of interviews. We educated from prison. Linda at her prison in Kentucky, Larry in Texas, and I at the federal prison in Minnesota. And when we got out of prison, our hope, our joy was strong. And we went back into the struggle, joining tens of thousands of people, I'm sure many here in Oregon, trying to stop that military aid to El Salvador. That got up to a million dollars a day, all from our tax money. But we could not, we could not stop the killing, the suffering, the death. Now they went after the Jesuits. The Jesuits, they run 28 universities here in the U.S., lots of high schools, very influential order. At their university in San Salvador, they were educating the world about what was going on in El Salvador. They referred to the issue as idolatry, the worship of the false gods of wealth and power. And they began to name those institutions and individuals who were worshiping the false gods. And they, like Bishop Romero, got the death threats. And they also said, where are we to go? We cannot abandon our people. November the 16th, 1989, the military, after midnight, moved into their campus dragged these six Jesuits out of their rooms. With them, a young mother, their co-worker, Elba, along with her teenage daughter, Selena. And they were all shot at close range. They were massacred. <laughs> this made the front pages of our newspapers. It angered many of our members of Congress, many of them who knew some of the Jesuits, educated at some of their high schools and universities. All of a sudden, they become closer to the issue. They send a congressional task force to El Salvador to investigate. They come back reporting that those who did the killing, those responsible for the massacre, were trained in the United States at the U.S. Army School of the Americas at Fort Benning, Georgia. At the time, I'm now working with my Marino community in Minnesota, doing a lot of work on El Salvador, peace and justice work. And it was time now to go to Georgia, return to Fort Benning, to investigate the School of the Americas. And I went there with the blessing and the support of my community. And right outside of the main gate, found this little apartment. A soldier had just been transferred. I moved in, rent 175 a month. This became our SOA watch. Back then we didn't have a movement. Friends came into town to join me there. Kathy Kelly, and if you know Kathy, we had dinner this evening. She's now in Portland giving some talks. Kathy Kelly, longtime peace activist from Chicago. 
Charlie Litke came in from California, a Vietnam veteran, recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor, a Jesuit, two Dominicans, three Salvadorans. We had three days of reflection. Well, what are we going to do, we said. That basic question that we must ask ourselves over and over again. What am I to do? What are we to do about this issue? So many are being killed, so many suffering. We knew, we knew that we could not be silent. What will we do? And at this nice Mexican restaurant, we decided on a fast. I've learned something, never plan a fast at a restaurant. <laughs> Always sounds like a great idea. And it was, it was. We began a water-only fast, camping out at the main gate. And Mahatma Gandhi was right, and Cesar Chavez and others who fasted and taught us something very, very important. If we go into a fast trying to expose an evil, an injustice, trying to express our solidarity with others, with love in our hearts, you can't go wrong, they said. And that was our experience. So much began to happen. Our hearts were moved in the hearts of others. Every day we would congregate from five to six at the main gate where people would bring their, their music, their poetry, their experiences, where we're all uplifted. Two, three o'clock in the morning, soldiers would come, fearful to be with us during the day. They would come and wanted to talk with us about why we were on this hunger strike. What, was our, what did we believe in so deeply was their question. Our fast ended after 35 days. The body was weak, but the spirit was strong. We got healthy again, and we had to now do research. We had to find out more about the School of the Americas, which was hiding behind this wall of secrecy. We learned early on that over 50,000 soldiers from 18 countries in Latin America were being trained here. Today, most of them coming in from Colombia, Colombia. They came here to learn commando tactics, counterinsurgency techniques. Who were the insurgents, we asked, and learned that they were the landless farmers, university students, tin miners, factory workers, labor leaders, especially in Colombia. They were the targets of those who were being trained at this school, known in Latin America as Una Escuela de Asesinos, a school of assassins. And then we learned, which hit the front pages of newspapers like the Washington Post and the New York Times, that there were manuals in this school that advocated torture that got the school in big trouble. <coughs> And then when the United Nations Truth Commission report on El Salvador was made public and revealed that those who killed Bishop Romero trained here, those who raped and killed the church women graduates, the 27 who killed the Jesuits and the two women, 19 of them graduates. And the list went on and on. And we said, let's, it's time now to educate ourselves more about this issue, educate the public, the media, and members of Congress. There was so much ignorance on this issue. We began a website, had to spread the word. We started traveling, taking our research into churches, colleges, peace groups, talking about that school of assassins down in Georgia. And these, we said, Every November around the time of the mask of the Jesuits and the two women, let us gather at the main gate of Fort Benning, put our feet there, to keep alive the memory of the victims and call for the closing of this school, all paid for with our tax money, all done in our name. That first year we had just a handful of us 
The next year, a couple hundred came. We continued to travel. We decided to, to, to make a, our first documentary, 19 minutes long, called it School of Assassins. Got Susan Sarandon to narrate it for us. Got us an Oscar nomination. Sold over 18,000 copies. All of a sudden, more and more people are hearing about that school down in Georgia. And then a few thousand show up. I'm happy to report that this last November, some 20,000 came. And as we looked out at the sea of people, over half were college and high school students, which brings a lot of joy to us to see the youth of our country, the students who have really become somewhat of the backbone of our movement. Also gathered there were a lot of sisters, the nuns, who joined our movement in the very beginning, who passed the very first resolution way back in 1993, calling for the closing of the school. The Leadership Conference of, of Religious Women with 20, I'm sorry, 78,000 nuns as members. And look out, <laughs> thousands of letters will arrive in those offices in Washington. Right after the nuns, the Presbyterian Church came out, passed overwhelmingly with, with their church, another resolution similar calling for the closing of the school. The Lutherans, the Methodists, NAACP, United Church of Christ, all the peace churches. And I'm also, also happy to say that over half of our Catholic bishops signed on to a resolution calling for its closing. The other half, they're still studying it. <laughs> When we gather, we had a lot of veterans there this last November who have come into our movement, Vietnam vets, Iraq vets, a lot of senior citizens, the grandmothers for peace always there with us, a lot of parents with their children. We're there speaking with one voice. We're there in the name of peace. It's a big celebration of hope. That weekend we have many, many different workshops at the convention center. A lot of billboards now welcoming us. Welcome peacemakers. In the early days, those signs said, they referred to us as a small group of outside agitators. <laughs> Leave town. But then when our numbers got up to about 5,000, I got a call from the Visitors Bureau. <laughs> when is your next convention going to be? <laughs> All of a sudden, we're going to have a convention. And I, I didn't realize that we were pumping a lot of money into that community, filling up the hotels and restaurants. And now I must say, really, we've got a, you know we've got some critics, but they 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 welcome the protesters today, and many are sincere because I know I've lived there for years now, and they talk about their good experiences with those who come into town every weekend, every every November. And we're going to, in Sunday, it's more solemn. We have our f solemn funeral procession. How many have been down with us in November? You know that experience. <laughs> we're marching nine abreast. Thousands are holding the crosses, some of the Star of David, photographs of the victims. The names are called out in the ages, many of them children. At the end of each name called in unison, thousands will say, Presente, this person is present. And it's here that we touch on the sacred, many weep. We get to this fence. There's these huge two fences now, chain link fences topped with barbed wire. These signs that say, No trespassing. I won't tell you where I got this sign here. <laughs> we get to the fence and we put our crosses and religious symbols on that fence. You can't see the other side. We turn it into something very sacred. Early on, it became our tradition when we gathered there.
to go on to Fort Benning. Some felt compelled to do that, to take the message to the, to the headquarters. When we do that, when we cross that line, they say we're trespassing, we're arrested and brought to trial and then sent to prison. I'm happy to report that over 250 of our people now have gone off to prison. And Oregon is well represented. <laughs> and we call our prisoners, they're called our prisoners of conscience. And they have so energized our movement. And we're honored to have some of our prisoners of conscience here this evening. Um, Ann Huntworth. Um, <laughs> Shani Geiger Teller. Shani, where, where's Shani? <laughs> Kathleen Fisher. I don't know if Kathleen is here. Kathleen. <laughs> Philip D'Onofrio. Is Philip here this evening? Uh, Lisa Hughes. Peg Morton. Corbin Street and our dear friend Pat Lithke, who passed away just a few months ago, and we remember him in a special way and say, Presente. Um, <laughs> did I leave out any of our prisoners of conscience who might be here? Forgive me if I did. Let me say we are gonna be back at the main gate in November. It's the weekend before Thanksgiving, 22nd, 23rd. It would be a great blessing if you can be back with us or come for the first time. A great blessing to our movement. Just real quick, two signs of hope in our movement. We have a bill in Congress that's going to be coming up for a vote real soon. Last year, we lost by six votes to cut off the funding. Six votes. Letters to your members of Congress are extremely important. We can do it, we think, this coming year. And if we do close it, we're going to have this big fiesta at the main gate. We're going to celebrate for three days. We're getting there. And what's really energizing our movement is our Latin America initiative. A couple years ago, we got an invitation from friends in Venezuela, Lisa Sullivan, a longtime Marino missionary there, invited us to come and meet with President Hugo Chavez. You may have heard about this president. <laughs> we went, and at that meeting, we got right to the point. Will you withdraw Venezuela's soldiers at this school? Venezuela had sent over 4,000 here. He said he would get back to us. Three weeks later, an official letter came to our national office in Washington that Venezuela had immediately withdrawn all of their troops from the school. <clears throat> he said, we said, let us now form, put together a delegation and go to all of these countries in Latin America that are sending their troops and meet with their presidents, defense, ministers, their indigenous leaders, social movement leaders, human rights leaders, and request that they also sabotage to the school. And I have to tell you, over the last year and a half, we've been on the road a lot, 15 countries. We're blessed to have, as our coordinator, Lisa Sullivan, 22 years as a Marinola missionary in Latin America. Carlos Mauricio, a survivor of torture from El Salvador on our team. Linda Panetta, a peace activist for many years and a photojournalist, along with Joe Mulligan, a Jesuit priest who is from Detroit, who has lived now for many years in Nicaragua and others. Let me just say, there is a sea change taking place in Latin America. Countries that have been very dominated by the United States, often referred in our visits and meetings as El Imperio, the empire, they are saying basta. 
They are breaking away from the empire. They are saying that nunca mas, never again will we be allowed to go into their country. Now with leaders like Evo Morales from Bolivia, in a country where the majority are indigenous, the Aymari and the, in the Quechua, and the first time in that country's history they have their first president who is from the indigenous people. And it's given them great hope. In Argentina, in Ecuador, we met with President Rafael in Korea, and in other countries, we see where that fear that was so alive, that was kept that way by the military, is now being replaced by hope, by hope. And it's a wonderful thing to behold. Fear is such a terrible thing. And to replace that by hope, it's beautiful, it's wonderful. And we met with these different presidents, and I'm happy to report after many meetings and speaking at universities and press conferences in these countries, when we meet with so many people, they have heard of our movement, but they didn't realize how large the movement was. And they are really shocked when they hear that in the empire, there have been a few hundred of people from our movement who have gone to prison to express our solidarity with their cause. And they are very moved by that. And I'm happy to say, joining Venezuela have been Bolivia, Argentina, Costa Rica, and Uruguay. Five countries now have cut off their... <laughs> this coming month, we'll be going to Uruguay, I'm sorry, we're going to Paraguay to meet with the new president, President Lugo. And then we're going from there to Chile to meet with the defense minister, talk with the uh, survivors of torture there, and hopefully meet with their president, Michel Bachelet. And then later to Brazil and other countries. So our hope is strong. Let me just say that in closing. Um, we're not going away. We're going to keep our hands on the plow. We can close down the school. We can shut it down. A school like this should not exist. It should not exist. And we're going to shut it down. But I must say, we need your help. We need your voices. We need your prayers. We need your energy. We can all do something to help close this school, and we can do it well. And as Bishop Oscar Romero said before he was assassinated, he said, let those who have a voice speak for those whose voices have been silenced. And that's where you and I come in. As people of faith, as people of goodwill, as people of conscience, we have a voice. We've got many gifts that we have not discovered yet. And I just hope that each of us can speak clearly and act boldly during these challenging times today. Thank you very much. You've been listening to Father Roy Bourgeois talking about the struggle to close the School of the Americas, the work of SOA Watch. In a moment, we'll return to the question and answer segment of Father Bourgeois' presentation. To find out more about SOA Watch, please visit their website at www.soaw.org. You'll find information about the many parts of the broad campaign to shut down the School of the Americas and how you can support their work and become a part of this struggle. And now we return to the question and answer segment of the presentation. Father Bourgeois spoke at the Augustana Lutheran Church in Portland, Oregon on September 15, 2008. Father Bourgeois started by telling the audience one of the ways they could make donations to SOA Watch. Also, if you would like to make out a check, just make it out to SOA Watch, SOA Watch, uh, and 
it will go to keep the SOA watch moving ahead. And what we're doing really now, there's an urgent need in the, what's going to be collected here in Oregon. We're going to use that specifically for our Latin America initiative and to go to more countries to help us shut down the School of Assassins. So again, whatever you give will be appreciated and help us move ahead. The first question for Father Bourgeois was about discussion a year or so back that the School of the Americas would not be shut down, but would be moved to a location in Central or South America. Does Father Bourgeois know about these plans to move the school? Yes, we've been hearing uh, rumors, scuttlebutt about this. Now, the closest we could come to uh, with this preparing, we think, for another S-way when this one shuts down is in El Salvador. We spent three hours actually at this site. It's called ILEA, the International Law Enforcement Academy. They're training, they say, mostly law enforcement personnel there, but also said that there will also be training military there. Instructors are military from mostly Central American countries. It's all financed by Homeland Security, uh, the DEA, and our Justice Department, all paid for by the U.S. and by our tax money. They're planning on making this a permanent, long-time military school here. And what they said to our delegation was that they want to make El Salvador secure for investors. Right now, it's very, very dangerous for corporations and their personnel to come and live in a country like El Salvador. High crime rate, lots of drugs. Not once did they mention improving conditions for the poor. Not once did we hear any apology or acknowledgement of wrongdoing and our involvement in the Civil War there and how we were complicit and the over 75,000 killed, most of them landless farmers, campesinos, human rights leaders, and others in El Salvador. No acknowledgement of any of our participation there. I'm happy to say that in El Salvador, that there are human rights groups there and university students who are really upset with ILEA. And they are organizing against it. One last thing, um, as we know that, you know, our country, the empire, is arming the world. This base down in Georgia at Fort Benning, um, it's one of many bases. We have, but it's the flagship, it's the most important from Latin America. It's the symbol of our foreign policy in Latin America. But outside of the United States, we have over 400 military bases where we are training many of their soldiers outside of the U.S. An excellent book is The Sorrows of Empire by Chalmers, uh, help me out here. Johnson. Chalmers Johnson. Chalmers Johnson, Sorrows of Empire, where he gets into much more detail about militarizing the world, please. The next question is about the privatization of a lot of the functions that have been a part of the traditional military, including training. Companies like Blackwater are providing war fighting services, but also military and security training. These companies are not accountable to the government, and certainly not to any democratic process, and they pose a significant threat as they are setting up bases here in the United States. It's likely that many of the people who work as mercenaries for these private companies got their own military training at the School of the Americas or at similar American military bases. This all seems to be a part of an overall militarization of our society. Has SOA Watch forged alliances with groups like Amnesty International and other organizations to get the visibility needed to win in this struggle 
and to oppose this process of militarization. We've worked very closely with Amnesty International. Uh, three years ago, they came out with, uh, I don't have it with me, with a very important document um, calling for the closing of the school, getting into the torture manuals and, and why exactly this school should be touched, uh, uh, closed. What they're asking for also is not just the closing amnesty as we do. We want more than just shutting the doors at the school. Uh, we want that school to be investigated. Uh, and this is what we're finding. It's consistent with what we are finding in our travels in Latin America. Uh, the victims, the survivors, those who still grieve and mourn for their loved ones who have been disappeared and killed by the, their militaries, they want the truth to be known, to be told. And they are so true. They are saying there will never be reconciliation in our country. There will never be healing until we know the truth. And in Chile, Argentina, and other places, uh, it's that moment. They're going after the bullies. They're in a position now because of the military is being sidelined. They can bring them to trial for their crimes against humanity. When we were in Argentina, it was a sacred time in a way. It was the 30th anniversary of the beginning of their coup that began the dirty war. And President Kirchner, before tens of thousands, said, shame on our military for what you have done to our people. Nunca mas, he said, never again will we allow you to do this. And then he said, shame on our media for looking the other way and for remaining silent. And then he also said, shame on our church leaders for their silence and complicity with the military. Most church leaders were not like Bishop Romero. And as we travel through Latin America today, I'm sad to say that many have left their churches, many of them Catholic, because their church leaders, clergy and bishops, during those years where the military ruled, their church leaders were silent, or like in El Salvador, where some were high-ranking officers, bishops who were in the military as high-ranking officers acting as chaplains and said nothing about what was going on there. And because of that, in El Salvador, Bolivia, Chile, Argentina, and Peru, those countries are suffering, the church is suffering because of its sins of the past. Um, we have lost a lot of credibility there, a lot of credibility. As we are losing, church leaders are losing credibility in the U.S. today because of their silence on this war in Iraq and other critical moral issues today. Uh, more questions, please, about issues. Yeah. Sure. The next question was about the corporate media. Can you talk about your experiences trying to persuade the corporate media to report fairly and accurately on these issues? When we started, I must say it was very difficult to try and get, it's a big challenge to try and get the mainstream media to cover this issue. We had two busloads, I'll never forget, in the early days on Martin Luther King Day. That's when our movement was just beginning to blossom. They came from Minnesota, Veterans for Peace, most of them Vietnam vets. They came to have a two-day vigil, an all-day vigil on Martin Luther King at the main gate of Fort Benning. And they came with about 50 of these doors with hundreds and hundreds of signatures shut the doors at the School of the Americas. And we had them there on display, we had a press conference. And it's amazing, the local paper 
did not send their reporter to this press conference of these veterans, but sent the reporter to the commander, commandant at the school to ask him what did he think about the veterans from Minnesota who arrived. Totally irresponsible. I mean, it was just, just inexcusable. So before leaving the next day, we all went to the local paper. And we had us, we were all marched for about a, with carrying our signs and some of the doors to that newspaper. And we said, we're not leaving this building until we see the publisher, the managing editor, and that reporter who should have been with us at that press conference. And it was a turning point, I must say. And what we found was that they were lazy, they didn't do their homework, and we started to educate them. And then they brought on another publisher who was much more, uh, much more supportive um, about what was going on here. And it, but it's always been a challenge, but we always now for the last few years have been having an Associated Press reporter with us. He puts it on the wire, AP reporter from Georgia. And it goes out to hundreds of newspapers around the country. Got some good coverage, usually each year in USA Today, the biggest, the biggest daily of the country. The problem, though, with the big papers, New York Times and the Washington Post, some years ago sent down a reporter, had a big spread, big spread with photos, very positive, never returned, simply said, uh, we have covered that story before. It's old news. And we said, no, no, it's not old news. About our prisoners of conscience, I must say, whenever uh, they send Ann and our other POCs to, to prison, it generates a lot of publicity. When they sent Sister Dorothy Hennessy, a sister of St. Francis from Dubuque, Iowa, to prison, Sister Dorothy being 88 years old, they sent um, and got six months in prison with her companions. Uh, there was a large group there. There might have been, I think, 27 that particular class. Um, they, they found out about Sister Dorothy. They sent a reporter before she went to prison after the trial she had. They usually give us a couple of weeks to get our personal things in line in order. So they sent to, to Dubuque, Iowa, a reporter from the New York Times, photographer, big spread in the New York Times. The next day, Sister Dorothy is on Good Morning America. <laughs> We've never been on Good Morning America before. But let me say, you never, never know. Sometimes when we're expecting a lot of media, they're not there when we don't expect them all of a sudden. But we have a media a working group. They arrive a week early for our big protest. They, in one of the hotel rooms, and they're reaching out to the world, trying, you know, sending out uh, emails, faxes, alerting the media, inviting them to come and cover this. Uh, please, please. The next question was whether Father Bourgeois had spoken with Senator Barack Obama or someone working for the Obama campaign. Important question. We met, we were trying so hard to get to him, uh, even before now, when it's so hard now to get to him. Uh, we met with uh, Congressman John Lewis from Georgia, from Atlanta, who is a good friend of uh, Senator Obama. And he was going to get us that meeting, but then, things really got difficult. It's so hard to get time with them. Um, but we're hoping for a meeting very soon with some of his senior advisors. Needless to say, needless to say, um, if McCain gets in, uh, we're in big trouble. We're in big trouble. With Obama, I must say, there will be problems, I think, especially over this Afghanistan situation and the war in Iraq that we are disappointed in. But when it comes to this issue and other issues, without a doubt, we feel that Senator Obama will be uh, the person who will help us close the school. Um, yeah, please. 
The next question for Father Bourgeois was about recent events in Bolivia. Following the election of Evo Morales as president, the United States has increasingly worked to undermine the government. Can you talk about the situation there and the U.S. government's response to the Morales presidency? Thank you very much. Uh, Bolivia is very much in the news now. Um, as you've been perhaps reading, um, while he has the support of the majority of his people who are indigenous, um, there's a group in Santa Cruz who historically has controlled uh, the natural resources. They're the wealth of the country, the power of the country in Santa Cruz, in the Pondo area. And our ambassador, U.S. ambassador, was expelled because it was documented proven that he was behind a lot of the, the protest that was coming out of Santa Cruz. Happy to see how Venezuela, how Lula in Brazil, um, Daniel Ortega from Nicaragua, and the president of Honduras who are expressing their solidarity with President Evo Morales. But I must say we're very concerned, very concerned about uh, Bolivia at this point. We do believe that the empire, that our country, is not simply uh, letting happen what's happening uh, in Latin America today. Countries breaking away from the empire. We are pumping a lot of money in Venezuela, in Bolivia, and other countries who are moving away from the empire to undermine, to undermine the vision that these new leaders have. Uh, it's serious. Uh, they, we, of course, we are in a position with the power that this country has and the resources. We are in a position to cause a lot of problems, a lot of problems. Uh, while the militaries are being sidelined, they want this school down in Georgia to continue because it's their way really of holding on to the military influence down there, which we see this school really as an obstacle to democracy. Um, please. Um, yes. The next member of the audience talked about the delegations led by Lisa Sullivan to these regions in Latin America, in particular recently to the World Social Forum in Venezuela. This member of the audience strongly recommended taking part in one of these delegations as a way to learn more about the people of these regions, the challenges they face, and the work that they are doing to secure peace and justice in their countries and communities. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, be sure and go to our website, soaw.org. Uh, there's all kinds of more, much more information than I've given here about the issue, but also these delegations that uh, Lisa uh, is the, you know, the facilitator of. We have these delegations that go to different countries in Latin America, Bolivia, Venezuela, others. And I agree, the most, and when, I, when I'm speaking, I know at high schools and colleges, I say the most important thing that we can do as U.S. citizens and you as a student is get a passport. Get a passport and go on one of these delegations. And there is just so much to be learned. Uh, lastly on that, I always say to our greatest enemy in our country today is ignorance, ignorance. Uh, we know so little about our country's foreign policy and the effect it has on other countries. We know so little about other cultures and their history is so much older than our own. And um, thank you for reminding us that really it's just so educational, so important for us to leave our own country and really what we, we become, you know, this citizen diplomacy. Um, peace is so important that we cannot wait or rely simply on our leaders uh, to bring about peace in the world because as we have learned, uh, they simply don't do it. They don't do it. Yeah, please. 
We've heard how in other parts of the world uh, people uh, have been brought to justice for crimes against humanity through the process of the, the Hague, the, uh, the, the court there. Uh, what are the possibilities of, of that same process taking place to bring the people in, uh, who are responsible for violence and for terrorism in the, this part of the world to justice as well? And our own country. Yes. Without a doubt, without a doubt, I mean, this is what many of us talk about. I remember we wanted to bring Henry Kissinger to trial for his crimes against humanity in Vietnam, um, Gene Kirkpatrick and, and others. Uh, right now, um, I mean, we have never apologized to what we did to the people of Vietnam. True, 57, 58,000 of our own, their names are on the wall in Washington. Uh, over two million, two million Vietnamese were killed, many by bombs that were dropped by those pilots from, that we refer to them now as war heroes, uh, who dropped bombs on villages. Uh, civilians in Hanoi and these hamlets of the Mekong Delta. No apologies. We refer to them somehow as heroes. They are criminals. We, our leaders, and all of us who serve there, uh, we have blood on our hands. This war in Iraq, what else is there to say? So many of our leaders have blood on their hands. And I and many would, would hope that one day, as you say, they can be brought to trial for their crimes against humanity. Right now, there are some dictators in Latin America who will not leave their countries. As Augusto Pinochet, General of Pinochet from Chile, years ago went off to England and uh, was arrested, detained, and Spain wanted him to come to their country to answer for his crimes against humanity. And ever since that day, there are many dictators who are hesitant to leave the country, uh, knowing that they could very well be arrested and brought to trial. Uh, maybe a couple of more, I don't want to keep you too late too long, a couple more please. The next member of the audience asked Father Bourgeois if he would recommend a Catholic church here in Portland that does this kind of work, and not only in Latin America or elsewhere in the world, but also right here in Portland or in other parts of the United States. If I understand your question, I, not being from Portland, um, I do know there are a couple of churches who are not big into peace and justice issues, or perhaps they are but would have problems uh, in bringing speakers who address issues of justice. Um, what I would recommend really is, I mean, I, I have a lot of friends um, who are shopping, who are looking, simply because they're people of faith, of uh, not only the faith, uh, Catholic tradition, but other faith traditions. They are really struggling to find a faith community, Catholic or others, that they can go to, where they can feel comfortable, where they will be in a church or a synagogue, a place of worship, where they will get more than these little spiritual lollipops. You know what I mean? Where they will be talking about this war in Iraq, this issue down in Georgia, this issue of discrimination, Asking a basic question, why can't we have women priests in our church? Issues like this. And, and I know something else I think that's very important that I and others have recommended and, and done. If, you're, if, if you are plugged into a particular church or synagogue or faith community, and your spiritual leader, when you gather, is silent on these critical moral issues and issues of injustice in your church and in the world. If they are silent, 
every time you you meet in worship um, I think it's very important to form a delegation to meet with that spiritual leader and simply ask what is the problem here you and this is what Bishop Romero came to the Campesinos, I remember in the early days, got together with him, the leaders, and said, you are our bishop. We would like to educate you, empower you. And he began to speak truth to power. And if, again, our church leaders, spiritual leaders, are silent on Iraq and all these other issues of injustice, I think they should be asked, in a perhaps you know very loving and kind way if you don't have the courage to speak out on these issues which your office demands will you please have the courage to step down and turn over that position to someone who will speak I think this is just I think it's just because of the seriousness of of the world we live in today and there are so many people being killed in Iraq as we gather here in Afghanistan and other places please the next question for Father Bourgeois was about democratic elections this member of the audience observed how in the United States there was very strong evidence that the previous two presidential elections in 2000 and 2004 had been stolen and that elections in Latin American countries have often also involved fraud on a very large scale. How have progressive leaders like Evo Morales and others been successful in their efforts to win in democratic elections in light of the history of stolen elections and corrupt voting in Latin America? In countries like Ecuador, Venezuela, Bolivia, these are countries that have suffered under dictatorships or corrupt governments and yet there have been democratic elections that have brought these progressive leaders into government. Let me just say real quick, it's my experience and the experience of others I know in our delegation when we visit these countries, we talk about this like what you bring up here. Every country we go to, these 15 countries and others we will visit, um, they're all unique, they're all different, they all have their own history. Some, when I, we went, going back to Bolivia was a wonderful, wonderful experience. When I got there, I met with friends I hadn't seen for years. When I was kicked out of Bolivia, some were exiled, they were able to come back later. And we got together and um, we said, you know, who would have ever thought when we were visiting political prisoners that one day some of these political prisoners, some being tortured, would be ministers in the government, like the vice president today in Bolivia. Who would have ever thought when we were organizing and fearful, living in despair, when we couldn't see any hope at all, when it was all dominated by fear, we were hiding people in our little houses and communities we keep some there for a day or two days then we had to take them to they were after the military was after them and if they found them they would be tortured some would be killed the fear was so per pervasive but then now today uh, there's Evo Morales as president from the Campo from the Aymara and we rejoiced in that. Um, and we heard the stories in Argentina, uh, in Chile, where the, there's the first woman president, Michelle Bachelet, whose father was imprisoned, who was a general, and turned on General Pinochet, was imprisoned and died in prison. And other members her of her family were survivors of torture. And here she is today as the president. Uh, and we saw other examples of that. And it, it just, uh, there are other countries, I must say, that are extremely difficult. The most difficult, Colombia. I know some of you uh, have been to Colombia, uh, El Salvador. 
um, very difficult. These two countries, especially Colombia and El Salvador, receiving lots and lots of aid from the United States, from the empire. Uh, Colombia, the fourth largest recipient of all countries. Boliv uh, El Salvador, the sadness to see El Salvador, such a poor country, with over 300 of their soldiers in Iraq. And at the university where we spoke to hear how sad and how angry the students at the universities are to know that their country, as poor as they are, have their soldiers in Iraq. But in a way, they're so dominated by the empire that they feel somewhat powerless. But there, too, it will change. There are elections coming up in March, and there things are happening, poco a poco, little by little there. Maybe one more, please. The next member of the audience, speaking on behalf of herself and other Roman Catholic women priests and other women within the Catholic Church, thanked Father Bourgeois for advocating for the right of women to become priests within the Catholic Church. Taking a forthright and outspoken stand on this issue has brought Father Bourgeois into conflict with the Church hierarchy, and this member of the audience expressed her gratitude for his speaking out on this important controversy within the Catholic Church. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just, um, just for a moment, ex you said it's another issue, but I, I want to say for me, it, it's, it's an issue that connects so well to this issue of peace and justice. Um, just perhaps, um, maybe we can end here, but I've come to the conclusion as a Catholic priest, as a person of faith, that I cannot possibly speak out against about the injustice of the war in Iraq. I cannot possibly speak out against the injustice and the suffering being caused by that school down in Georgia, the SOA that we want closed, and be silent about the injustice in my own church. It's not possible. And let me just say, and this is very personal, when I returned from Bolivia years ago in my peace and justice ministry, I started meeting women who began to educate me as the poor of Bolivia had educated me. They introduced to me their experience, their stories, their struggle, their suffering. And I've met a number of women who have shared to me in a very, very personal and deep way their faith and their call as Catholics to be priests in the Catholic Church. And I have come to the conclusion and have asked this question of myself and I now ask my fellow priest and I would ask the bishop of this diocese and all bishops and the Pope, a basic question. Who are you as a man? Who are we as men to say that our God has called us to, pre to be priests in the Catholic Church? That our God has invited us to ministry as priests? What do we say to the women who like us say our God has called us to the priesthood, has invited us to ministry. Could you please answer my question? What do we say to the women who like us say we too are called? And I have, I must say more recently, asked that question of bishops and fellow priests, and I get no answer. Why? Because I simply have come to the conclusion we cannot give an answer. Who are we to tamper with the sacred? Who are we to say that our call to priesthood as men is valid? 
but your call as women is invalid. No, no, it does not work this way. Prejudice in liturgical clothing is still prejudice. Discrimination 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 is at the very, very core of this issue. Discrimination, no matter how hard we may try to justify it, in the end, it is always a sin. It is always immoral. And lastly, I just want to say I have come to the conclusion that that, that day will come. And when it comes, we will say, wow, this is a no-brainer. Why didn't we get it? Uh, I grew up in the South, and our little Catholic church, the last five pews, I can still remember that, were for our black brothers and sisters, the members of the church. And I ask, we all ask today, how, how could that have been possible with the priest up there allowing that to continue year after year? He never once said, we got a problem here. We never heard from him about this is wrong. This is wrong. And it wasn't until Washington passed the law to integrate the schools that our little church was integrated. And this issue, of course, will be resolved, but not without a price, not without a price. I have poked a lot of beehives in my day, as many have. Uh, Anne and our prisoners of conscience, and many of you, you have poked beehives. And on this issue of women being ordained in the Catholic Church, it is by far the biggest beehive that I have ever poked. It's a big one. And I think the reason it is so big, I think at the very core is this issue of power. Power. There are those in power who don't want to give it up. There are those in power who feel threatened, who feel threatened by women um, coming to be full members in the faith community but they've got to give it up. They've got to give it up, just as the dictators in Latin America had to give, the bullies of Latin America had to give up their power. I have to say this, there are bullies in the church and they will have to give up that power. And lastly, I simply say to them, to our bishops and to fellow priests and to others, all who will listen to me now, it's so connected to all these issues that I work on with others of justice. Uh, we need, my Catholic Church is going through a very grave crisis today, a lack of vocations. Churches are closing in New Orleans, Boston, Chicago, Detroit, wherever I go. I hear people telling me as a Catholic priest, they're concerned, why are all of these churches closing? We need vocations. They know women who are ready to serve as priests and they have so much to offer. And all I can say is we need my church, the Catholic church, I know as other faith communities, need the experience of women, the wisdom of women the compassion of women and the courage of women to make our church complete and whole. And that day is going to come, it's going to come, but like in everything there will have to be a price to be paid for that. And I'm waiting, um, I've gotten the support from my Marino community, however, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for another decision to be coming down from Rome. Um, I'm concerned about that, but I just want to say that uh, I am very much at peace with uh, my decision to go to the ordination of a, of a friend, Janice, one of our prisoners of conscience who has felt for many years called to priesthood. 
and it was a joy and honor to be there with so many others to celebrate. This was something good to celebrate. It was about service. It was about love. It was about joy and hope. And uh, that was good for us to be there. And um, I feel very much at peace. And I think this is what we have learned. Our prisoners of conscience and all of us, when we follow our conscience, when we do what we know we have to do because of what's in our heart, when we follow our heart and our conscience, we are free. We are free. And there's nothing that they can do to us to take away that freedom, that peace, and that joy. Thank you. You've been listening to Father Roy Bourgeois talking about the struggle to close the School of the Americas, the work of SOA Watch. To find out more about SOA Watch, please visit their website at www.soaw.org. You'll find information about the many parts of the broad campaign to shut down the School of the Americas and how you can support their work. This program was produced by PDX Justice Media Productions of Portland, Oregon. To find out more about our work, please visit our website at www.pdxjustice.org. You'll find free on-demand streaming video and audio programs featuring speakers such as Phyllis Bennis, Rabbi Arik Asherman, Antonia Yuhas, Paul Krugman, P. Sinoth, Naomi Klein, and many, many others. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks for supporting listener-sponsored radio, public access cable television, net neutrality, independent bookstores, and all forms of grassroots democratic community media. Again, I just want to say it is, it's a blessing, it's good for us to be here. St. Paul said, when you're not welcomed in one place, kick the dust off of your shoes and go to another. And I just want to, I want to thank in a special way, of course, uh, our Lutheran sisters and brothers for their warm hospitality this evening, where we can come together and talk about peace and justice, which really I've come to the conclusion, as many of us have, it's at the very core of our faith. It took me quite some time to get on that road to peace and justice. When I grew up in this small town in Louisiana, when we gathered into our little church there, we didn't really critique U.S. foreign policy. We didn't uh, question our leaders. We didn't talk about peace and justice. We did not mention that sin of racism and sexism that was so alive in our community, in our church. I went to the State University. I got a degree in geology and worked hard at that degree. When I left college, it was during the days of Vietnam. It was very easy for me to join the military. I was taught to be patriotic. I spent the next four years in the military. In a way, it was my ticket out of Louisiana. Two years aboard ship as a young naval officer, went to a NATO station in Europe. And then when our leaders were saying we had to go off to Vietnam, um, I bought into that as many of us did. They said we were going to be the liberators. Our cause was noble. The same language that they used to justify the war in Iraq.
Isaiah, the prophet of the Hebrew scriptures, said it so well. He said, they will take evil and call it good. They will take the lie bottom up. We will be the peacemakers. Not the corporate executives, not the politicians, not the spiritual leaders who have grown silent. No. It is our responsibility. If there will be peace in our world, in our country, it must come from us. I came back from Vietnam. My year was up. And I must say I was so grateful to be alive back in Louisiana with my family, close-knit family, my siblings, my friends. And I came back different from that person I was when I went there. It was in Vietnam that I lost my hope. This joy that was so much a part of my life just fell apart. And that's what war does. It kills hope, destroys joy. And I wanted to try to rediscover that. I was led to the Marino community by a chaplain in Vietnam when I realized that peace was the only way that I'm going to refine, recapture my hope. And he recommended the Marino community working in 25 countries around the world serving the poor. He said they were healers. They were peacemakers. And I entered the community. And I must say, it began for me a whole new world. Six years in the seminary, a lot of reflection, a lot of studies. And then I was ordained a Catholic priest and now assigned to our work in Bolivia. Bolivia is pretty much very much in the news today. It's a very poor country. Most of the people of Bolivia throughout the developing world live on the edge. They struggle for survival. They're in the shacks without running water, without electricity. Most do not have schools for their children. When their children are sick, there's not a clinic to go to to get those needed medicines. After struggling through language school in Cochabamba, Bolivia, and I have to confess, I think I was the worst student to ever go to that school. When I spoke Spanish, they thought I was speaking this indigenous language, Aymara. <laughs> but I went into La Paz, a slum there, and I began to live with the people, the poor. And they became my teachers. And that's the way it works. If we will only dare to put our feet with them, the poor, the oppressed of our world, the victims of violence, and give it to you as truth. And this is what they did in Vietnam. And this is what our leaders did about Iraq. And we bought into that evil and that, those lies. But fortunately today, we can see the lie about what's going on in Iraq. We know it was a terrible mistake. And so many died for that mistake. It was in Vietnam that became a turning point in my life. The violence, the suffering there, losing friends, wounded there. I don't know what else to say other than I was forced into the arms of God. Death was close. I've come to the conclusion, not overnight, but through that experience in Vietnam that has just simply grown over the years, that we are not made for war. Read about the tens of thousands struggling with PTSD, the suicides. We are not made for war. Our God, a loving God, a creator, who has given us life that sacred and precious, did not make us for war. And I and many have come to the conclusion in our journey of faith, something very important and very clear. God does not bless war. God does not bless killing. God does not bless violence. 
God does not bless discrimination in its many forms. It saddens me to see the silence of our spiritual leaders, our church leaders. As a Catholic priest in my travels throughout the country, I'm often asked, why are our church leaders, our spiritual leaders, so silent on this war in Iraq? I do believe that many of our church leaders have become corporate executives. Our shepherds have become government sheep. And I have no doubt at all, if we had in the Catholic Church women priests and women bishops, that silence would be broken. I know that. But we have learned something very important. Peace will not come from the top down. No, no, no. It will come from the... They will teach us so much. Bolivia was living under a brutal dictator, General Bonzer, who came into power through a violent coup. And it angered me to see my country there, the United States, giving guns and training to the men with the guns, the bullies, the thugs. They ran the country. And the large corporations back then and today, they're coming into those countries like Bolivia where there are huge profits to be made from the cheap labor and those vast natural resources. They see us as El Imperio, the empire, the new conquistadors who are there to enrich ourselves, to live really, to profit from the blood and sweat of the poor. It's not complicated. People who live under such conditions day in and day out, year in, year out, begin to organize. They say, basta, enough. I, was, I must say I was very humble there as a, as a Catholic priest to be connected to the comunidades de base, the faith communities, the poorest of the poor, coming together in their small groups to read and reflect on the scriptures where they come to discover this loving God, a creator who has given to their country and every country more than enough resources for everyone to live comfortably and in peace. And they know that this is not God's divine will that they should live under these conditions. They know that the reasons are oppression, exploitation. Countries like the United States and others who come to exploit them. And they are feeling empowered by their God today, a liberating God, and out of this comes liberation theology. I'm sad to say that a lot of people, including leaders in the churches, are threatened by the word liberation. They prefer a model of church that's very patriarchal, hierarchical, top down. But liberation theology, that model is circular. Where all are welcomed into that circle as brothers and sisters, as equals. As hermanos y hermanas. And what's going on, they are simply being empowered by their faith. By their knowledge. And they're saying, basta. And the factories, the tin mines, the universities and throughout the small base communities. They're coming together to change their world. A world where they know there can be peace and justice and food for the table and a living wage for them and adequate housing and this is at the very core of their struggle. When the poor become organized and speak out against the oppressor there are serious implications. It's dangerous. Many are forced to flee the country with death threats. Many killed. The jails in Bolivia filled up with university students, factory workers, tin miners, and their spiritual leaders, priests and others. 
and I and others were able from the barrio, from the slum there, along with the Jesuit, a couple of Dominicans, we were able to get a pass to visit the political prisoners and documented many cases of torture. And it was after going to Washington with our findings to bring to congressional leaders, when I returned to Bolivia, I was arrested in my fifth year and forced out of the country. I came home very sad. I did not want to leave the people there in our work. I tried to go back, could not get a visa. My attention turned to El Salvador, a country far worse than the one I came from. Archbishop Oscar Romero had just been assassinated in his country, gone down in his church for his defense of the poor. Four churchwomen from our country who went there at the invitation of Bishop Romero to work with the poor were raped and killed by the Salvadoran military. Two of them good friends of the Marino sisters, Maura Clark and Eda Ford. When that happened, it brought many of us to El Salvador. And once again, when we were there, we found our country, the United States, deeply involved giving guns and training to those doing the killing. I must say I've never seen anything like El Salvador. I was more frightened there than in Vietnam and Bolivia. It was the slaughter of the innocents. So many disappeared. The knock would come on the door at night. There's a list. They're campesinos, the landless farmers, being paid a dollar a day to fix pick those coffee beans, university students and others, labor leaders, health 